I'm speaking today as somebody who knows something about psychology, supposedly. I do hope I know something about psychology after 25 years of working as a clinical psychologist and for 18 of those years working, teaching psychology at a university. I also hope I know something, a little bit about psychology to share with you from my life experience. And for the purposes of today, the narrative of my life is something like somebody who's experienced a severe amount of premature deaths from the age of eight to the present moment. Sounds like a mastermind topic. Hello, I'm Mike Solomon. I'm a husband and a father, a son and a brother and a friend. I work as a consultant clinical psychologist and an organisational consultant. I'm a non-smoker. For the last three years, since I was 48, I've been living with a diagnosis of advanced stage four lung cancer. Part of my work involves training people in the area of resilience for individuals, families, organizations, and communities. So for the past three years, since my diagnosis, I've been trying to practice what I preach. I've also brought along my little friend, a weeble. I'll explain why a little later. So let me tell you a little bit about us. Mike and Hilary, who he married in the end, myself and Johnny, who I also married in the end, and another couple, Elliot and Jane, who married in the end as well. We were all in a band together. Mockingbird, it was called. It was absolutely rubbish. <laughs> the only good thing about it was Mike on drums. Over the next 25 years or so, Mike and I hardly ever saw each other except at the odd Judo, you know, bar mitzvahs, weddings, and so on. But fast forward to about two years ago, January 2017, a chance meeting on the stairs of the Tavistock Clinic where Mike works. I was coming out of my first family therapy session, but this time I wasn't the therapist. I was the patient. I needed help to deal with the suicide of my husband, Johnny. Johnny, remember the guy from the band who I married in the end? Johnny, the amazing father of three sons, charismatic best friend to everyone, prolific author, inspiring teacher, Johnny, suffered from clinical anxiety and depression, and he killed himself in the end. But this isn't the end. It's just a very difficult, challenging transformation. So, after every family therapy session for one, the boys never did come, and that's material for another TED Talk, I'd go down the corridor, and I'd find Mike in his office, and we'd sit and we'd chat about life and death and cancer and psychology and weebles and what we'd have for dinner that night, you know, the big things that really matter. And he inspired me, and he continues to do so. And I cherish this sort of new old friendship. So, together, Mike and I have come up with this shit manifesto. It's not a shit manifesto. <laughs> it's a manifesto for managing shit after shit happens. There's eight points. I hope we can learn something. We as human beings are social. And we know that social support is extremely important for many areas of physical and mental health. As the Elizabethan poet John Donne said, no man is an island. This involves reciprocal relationships, giving and taking. As clinical psychologists, we're both used to working with our clients, helping them to think about issues they would like to change, change and supporting them to do so. More recently, we've come to appreciate the value and importance of accepting offers of help 
from other people for us. And even asking for help directly when we need to. There's a saying that it takes a village to raise a child. We've come to realise that the importance of the village extends way beyond childhood. No one person can meet every need, so the more varied the social support community or village, the better. Mentalising. Mentalising is sometimes described as thinking about thinking. It's the capacity to understand the mental states of ourselves and of others. Intentions, thoughts, feelings, desires in ourselves and others. Sometimes it can happen automatically and at other times it requires a lot of hard work and effort. Mentalising is impaired and slowed by intense emotion, like after trauma. Traumas can create minds that dare not reflect, minds that don't know how to reflect. Traumas can create minds that believe that to reflect is to be overwhelmed and out of control. Immediately after Johnny died, I couldn't reflect about anything other than getting on my pink slippers and walking down the stairs. Thankfully, over time and with these lessons, that's improved a bit. But as humans, Mike and I, we know that at times of deep stress, we prefer not to think and feel. But as psychologists, we also know that unmentalized experience, unprocessed emotion, usually manifests in symptoms, behavioral, psychological, and physical symptoms. We need to mentalize, we need to think about thinking with ourselves, with our children, with our students, and with each other. Mentalizing happens moment to moment. We're trying and learning how to live in the moment and be with the now. It's not easy. Learning is an ongoing process and we try not to beat ourselves up when we can't manage it. It's a difficult challenge to change a lifetime's pattern of thinking, but it is possible. It involves taking things one step at a time, however short that step needs to be. Now, I happen to be good at worrying. Thinking about what may happen at some point in the future, several steps ahead, then, not now. But it is possible to change that way of thinking. It involves training our attention. We can think of our attention as a muscle that needs training. If I want to get physically strong, I go to the gym. Not just once, but repeatedly, again and again. So it is with our attention muscle. The more we can train our muscle to focus on the thoughts we choose, the more we can control our thoughts. But this needs practice. Practice in refocusing our attention. The more I can choose where to focus my attention, the more I can control my thoughts, and the more able I am to say, I have thoughts, rather than thoughts have me. This is a key part of building resilience. Staring at the sun. OK, we're not actually suggesting you do this, or we couldn't do it in here anyway, and health and safety and all that. But in his book called Staring at the Sun, the American psychiatrist Irving Yalom explored how the knowledge of our own mortality affects every aspect of our unconscious mind as human beings. So, for example, everyone here in this room knows that the sheer certainty in life is death. But when it happens, even at the ripe old age of 90, we can't believe it. We're still shocked and surprised. Yalom proposes that it's this sort of deep fear, unconscious fear of death that lies at the root of his patients' anxieties and depressions. If we are to live whole and full lives, 
we need to be brave and stare at the sun. And in this tiny breath of space between birth and death, we can learn to savour every moment as if it were our last. We can learn to breathe and pause and slow down and look up and savour everything that we have, especially here in Happy Hampstead. Living in the moment being, is, means being with the now. And the now can be happy and wonderful and joyful. And the now can be disturbing, challenging and upsetting. The now really can sometimes be shit. Remember my friend the Weeble? In the days before the internet, children had to get their fun where they could. <laughs> this is simply a plastic figure with a weighted hemisphere base. Let's have a look at the Weeble in action. The advertising slogan at the time was, Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. This seems to me to be a really good way of describing resilience. We all wobble. Life is never smooth or perfect. But the key question is, what happens next? How can we bounce back like the Weeble? I've also come to learn that wobbling is not just something to be accepted and tolerated, but is actually essential for those times where we can't function at our best, and nor should we expect ourselves to. For at those times, we need to go easy on ourselves and be compassionate towards ourselves. At those times, we need to sit with and stay with what's difficult and dark and scary. Being with what's difficult and scary also involves naming it. The more we can name what it is that is so difficult or so frightening, the less power these things will have over us. If you know Harry Potter, think of the menace of he who must not be named who loses much of his perceived power when Harry simply calls him straightforwardly by his name, Voldemort. If we don't name things that are difficult and scary, if we don't name our own Voldemorts, then we run the risk of creating what the psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion called a nameless dread. The more we can name things, articulate things, acknowledge them, be with them, the more we can reduce this dread. Okay, dare we even mention the L word in a sort of scientific talk like this? Well, I'm gonna try, so you better stay with me. So the psychologist Harry Harlow did a load of monkey experiments back in the 1950s, I'm sure some of you know of them. He found that infant monkeys prefer pretend cloth monkey mothers to metal monkey mothers who actually have a bottle of milk. So they prefer to go and have a quick swig of the milk and spend all day cuddling and hanging out with their cloth monkey mothers. He called this contact comfort. And he was one of the first to emphasize its importance in healthy growth and development. Today, thanks to good technology, the psychoanalyst Susan Gerhardt uses brain neuroimaging to prove that babies' brains are actually physically shaped by love and affection. And don't worry, for those of us who are now out of nappies, thanks to brain neuroplasticity, further studies have shown that good attachments in older life, love, attention, even talking therapy, can actually influence the neural pathways of our brains. In short, Love is proven to soothe and calm. 
And if you really haven't got anyone to hug, you can take a leaf out of our book and try tree hugging. See what I did? Leaf, tree. It's a joke. <laughs> Shinrin-yoku, the Japanese way of forest bathing, is also well known to have massive health and psychological benefits. So next time you're wandering up on the heath, give it a try. There really are some tree bathing beauties to be embraced out there, trust me. This may not have been the most perfect TED Talk, but we happen to think perfection may be overrated. The paediatrician and psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott very helpfully described the idea of being good enough as a parent and generalising from that in many areas of life. We happen to think that rather than being perfect, it may be more important to be honest and open and authentic. And we've hoped we've managed to do that in our talk and that our talk has been good enough. OK, so the great Maya Angelou said, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. We hope these lessons show how. Thank you.